Друзі, я думаю, що ми можемо починати е, наш захід. Якщо в процесі ще будуть приєднуватись люди, ми будемо, будемо раді їх бачити. Е, сьогодні, е, власне, відбувається та подія, на яку ми особисто очікували досить довго. І е, нашим почесним гостем є Рорі Фінен, який є професором Кембриджського університету і е, не просто професором Кембриджського університету, а ще й професором українських студій в Кембриджському університеті, який у 2008 році якраз започаткував програму з українських студій і є автором книги «Кров інших. Кримський злочин Сталіна і поетика солідарності», яка була написана у 2022 році. Я думаю, що це той унікальний випадок, коли про Крим ми можемо говорити не тільки між собою, а ще й з тими, хто досліджує цю тему і має дуже цікавий погляд на те, що насправді відбувається в Криму. І для нас це особливо важливо, тому що е, ми точно знаємо, що питання Криму чомусь завжди так чи інакше намагаються ще ставити під сумнів. І для нас, українців, це не є темою для обговорення на предмет того, чи, це, чи Крим є частиною України, чи ні. Але тим не менш, для того, щоб ми краще розуміли і себе, і е, формували власну ідентичність, ми можемо сьогодні також мати можливість е, обговорити цю тему. Е, подія організована за ініціативою Фонду президента України з підтримки освіти, науки та спорту. І, е, власне, академічним партнером заходу є Український католицький університет, який сьогодні представляє Роман Назаренко, який є директором е, Інституту релігії та суспільства. Роман, я думаю, що е, все, все, все чітко. І е, особливість Романа ще й полягає в тому, що він сам е, є кримчанином. І е, я думаю, що це дозволить нам вивести розмову на найбільш неочікувані повороти. Е, ну, було би цікаво, насправді, почути, ми будемо мати цю можливість. Крім того, партнерами є, цього заходу є представництво фонду Фрідріха Наумана за свободу, центр, громадська організація «Центр Ейдос», представництво президента України в Автономній Республіці Крим, Національний офіс «Кримська платформа», кафедра тюркології Навчально-наукового інституту філології Київського національного університету імені Тараса Шевченка. То, як бачимо, насправді партнерів багато. Це дало можливість нам також максимально поширити інформацію. Пане Рорі, у нас насправді під час реєстрації було більше, майже там 400 бажаючих почути, послухати вас. Це, звісно, не межа. І я впевнена, що, що таких людей з кожним разом ставатиме все більше. Тому ми, насправді, будемо дуже-дуже раді почути ваші думки з приводу того, як взагалі тема кримських татар була відображена в літературі. Ну, і так, щоб не займати багато часу, я передаю слово Роман, для того, щоб він розпочав е, цю чудову дискусію і тему на предмет того, якою ми сьогодні зібралися. Дякую, Оля. Вітаю, Оля, вітаю, Рорі, вітаю вас, дорогі друзі. Дякуємо, що долучились до цього заходу. Я тоді теж кілька слів українською скажу, і тоді ми перейдемо на англійську, як ми і обіцяли е, в анонсі до сьогоднішньої лекції. Це дуже важлива насправді подія, і я завдання модератора, я сьогодні виконую роль модератора, не заважати спікеру, тому я попробую з цією місією сьогодні впоратись, і лише скажу кілька технічних речей на початку. Професор Фінін буде мати 45 хвилин своєї презентації, тобто ми можемо послухати думки професора, і тоді вже після цього у нас буде там плюс-мінус 30 хвилин для того, щоб поставити запитання. Якщо у вас є запитання, будь ласка, пишіть їх в чаті, я ті найцікавіші, на мою суб'єктивну думку, які будуть, то я їх оберу і задам професору, і тоді в нас вийде така, якби вже інтерактивна максимальна зустріч. Ось, тому 45 хвилин презентація професора, і тоді питання відповіді. Uh, so uh, now I'm uh, switching to English and uh, our lecture is called in today entitled actually Exploring Crimea Tatar History and the Cultures Through Literature and Solidarity. So uh, uh, Professor Finin, uh, first of all, I'm honored and delighted to have you here today and uh, thank you again that you, you are staying with us. And I'm just, you know, Olya just presented and uh, introduced Professor Finin, but I want uh, also to add just a few words from myself that Professor is the big friend of Ukraine and let us say strong voice in UK, but also in Europe, in the whole world. 
and is the is uh, you know strong voice who supports Ukraine. So nowadays, it's really important for us that you are supporting our country. And you're supporting the uh, Ukraine right now, and uh, I'm more than sure that you know this. But just again to emphasize, it's really important that Ukrainians really feel this feel this support. Uh, especially nowadays when some, you know, in the politics and geopolitics, we can see that um, sometimes it's a tension about the question dedicated to Russian Ukrainian war. So thank you again, Professor. And uh, the floor is yours. So we are delighted to hear you and uh, your presentation too. Thank you so much, Romana. C can you hear me? Everything's okay on the audio side. Wonderful. Well, first of all, um, thank you for the kind introduction. Um, I don't deserve it. And I have to say, I've spent uh, 25 years of my life um, working, living, uh, going back and forth to Ukraine. Ukrainians have always supported me. It's the least we can do to um, support you now, given that you're supporting and fighting for us. So thank you for this kind invitation. Thanks to the entire team at UKU, the Fund of the President of Ukraine for education, research, and sport, to the team at the Crimean Platform for all your support and partnership. Um, I really greatly appreciate it. E <clears throat> Я знаю, що сьогодні наша робоча мова англійська, але мені треба сказати, по-перше, державною мовою України, так? що ми в Кембриджі підтримуємо вас, ми з вами стоїмо, і ми знаємо, що ми сьогодні ще на один день ближче до перемоги, і ми також розуміємо, що ми повинні по всій Європі допомогти ці перемози, статися. Тобто, дякуємо. Саг Олонус. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, some objectives first for this session. I've been asked to, as Roman mentioned, talk to you, uh, and Olha as well, talk to you a little, uh, a little bit about my new book, which has the title Blood of Others, Stalin's Crimean Atrocity and the Poetics of Solidarity, to talk to you about its origins, its goals, and then my second objective is to discuss some highlights of Crimean Tatar history and culture, always with the view to dialogue with Ukrainian history and culture, because behind my book is a belief that there is so much connection and intersection between Ukrainian and Crimean Tatar cultures, and that we've only really begun to scratch the surface in researching them. Okay, so I had one version of this presentation planned in a different format um, earlier this week. And then uh, recently, I think actually just yesterday morning, there was an interview um, that I had done with the wonderful journalist uh, Anastasia Ringis with Ukrainska Pravda that touches upon many of the themes today. So uh, I don't want to repeat anything from the interview. I want to try to make the most of our time together, but there may be one or two notes of repetition, okay? And I want to stress here at the beginning how much I still need to learn about this topic myself, from those with uh, Ukrainian family backgrounds, from those with Crimean Tatar family backgrounds, and how much uh, I need to learn from you. And it is my hope that after our discussion today that we can cultivate the global field of Ukrainian studies a little bit more, that we can begin to experiment with fresh perspectives to the study of Ukraine today. Obviously, these fresh perspectives are needed so desperately right now. Um, part of what I will talk to you about today is the failure in Western scholarship to understand and study Ukraine. And I think part of that has been an ignorance about Crimea, and then more specifically, an ignorance about Crimean Tatar culture too. So uh, these fresh perspectives need to take risks. We need to, we need to take chances as well and to do it together. And in fact, I often think about Pavlo Tichina in Crimea in 1925 because Tichina had long been fascinated, as many of you may know, with Crimean Tatar language in culture. So 
here's uh, an excerpt. It's difficult to read on this slide, and I'll try to give you a better version in just a moment. But this is a, a letter that uh, Ticino wrote to his future wife, Lydia Papariuk, uh, in uh, August 1925. He was writing from Alushta on the southern coast of Crimea, one of uh, Adam Mitzkevich's favorite spots. And Tichina explains, as you see here, that he bought a few Tatar books at the bookshop. Buv u Tatarskom klubi u kniharnie knig Tatarski nakupiv hoci malo sce rozumiu achetaju. I really love this sentiment. Although he understands little, Tichina explains, he is reading all the same. So I love this idea because for me it captures what it means to be a student and scholar. We may not understand everything right now, but we need to try to read. We need to continue plowing ahead. We need to be undeterred in a constant pursuit of understanding. We can't wait. We need to move. So the challenge for us now, and this is why I love this initiative from the, the fund, is uh, for us to learn uh, to move together across the globe and advance the study of Ukraine and what Ukraine means for global civilization itself. So this is the, uh, the cover of uh, the book that Olha and Roman very kindly mentioned. And I came to this topic, um, I came to the subject of the book from the perspective of a so-called Ukrainianist. So I'm a student of the literature and, and culture of Ukraine. Um, I've published a number of articles, for instance, on Taras Shevchenko. In fact, I'm working on a new book about his work now because there's shockingly little about Shevchenko for the general English language reader. So if you go to a, a bookstore in London or New York and, and you want to find elements or evidence of Ukrainian literature, um, it's difficult to find. You may find works by Andrei Korkov, works of great history by Serhi Plokhi, Timothy Snyder, but literature is difficult to find. And uh, Shevchenko obviously needs to be better known. So that's something I'm working on now. But in my doctoral training at Columbia University in New York, I did my best to read as much material as I could. I spent a lot of time in, as so many of you do, in the Vernadsky Library in Kyiv. Um, and of course, um, one of the experiences I had reading was rather intimidating because it was reading Mikhail Hrushevsky, who of course wrote more than any one single human being uh, is capable of. He wrote, I think, pages upon pages, volumes upon volumes of work that would take teams of human beings uh, years to complete. And it was sometime in 2003 or 2004 when I read Hrushevsky's collection, Naparozi Novoi Ukraine, which among other things, looks back at the horrors of World War I, looks back at the horrors and the chaos of revolutions and civil wars, and explores this idea of a federation of peoples of the Black Sea. And there, uh, Hrushevsky employs the term Chornomorska Orientatsia, so a Black Sea orientation. And this was a term that really intrigued me immensely. So the question is, how does the study of Ukraine change when we look at the country and its history, not with some dependent reference to the national canon, or not with some dependent reference to Poland or Russia, but rather from the Black Sea? What if we look and think of the Black Sea, not as a force dividing peoples, but uniting them? What if we had as Ukrainianists, uh, Murski Dushi? Um, this orientation is at the heart of, for instance, Yuri Yanovsky's debut novel, Meister Korobla, uh, published in 1927-28, where the Black Sea is the measure of all things. It's a space in which one looks out at the sea from the shore and senses the boundaries of the possible. Yanovsky wrote in Maestro Korobla, for instance, um, So uh, I love that expression. And my, let's say, scholarly Black Sea orientation goes further I want us to try to consider the encounter, not just with the sea itself, but with the peoples on the other shores of the sea and with the peoples that influence our identities, our senses of ourselves. So the book is 
also a response to problems that we see every day in the news. Problems with so-called experts in international relations, people that in the West have um, captured a lot of attention, figures like John Mearsheimer, for instance, um, who have unfortunately dominated a lot of political discourse about Ukraine and Crimea for a very long time. We work in the humanities, in literature and culture, and I think it's our time to claim a place for the humanities in the conventional academic discourse about Ukraine and its politics now. So in my opinion, I think those of us who work in culture, language, literature, we've sometimes seeded questions. We've deferred questions about Ukraine as a political creature to analysts like Mearsheimer and political scientists who may be very good at tracking political technology. They may be very, be, be very good in, in uh, organizing sociological polls, but often don't look more deeply into culture and history. And I think that has led many in the West to misunderstand Ukraine. Um, and that's been something I've been fighting for a very long time. So naturally, we cannot adapt um, and take up a Black Sea orientation with research on Ukraine without studying Crimea. And so in my own work, um, I discovered that Ukraine uh, and Crimea was, was for me a, a, an intimate bond that I needed to explore. It was a, a real revelation for me because it became clear that we in the West had been studying Crimea all wrong. And to put it very simply, we have been fooled, I think, by Russian historiography, by Russian soft power. We failed to acknowledge and see what has been the defining historical, political, and social factor in Crimea's modern history. I think the one with the most importance and resonance today, and that is the phenomenon of settler colonialism. So this is the kind of colonialism where uh, imperial centers expunge native peoples resident in a particular place from the earth and then settle um, new peoples. We see this very horrifically across occupied parts of Ukraine today. In Slavic studies in the academic sphere, the question of settler colonialism was almost untouched. And this is um, a huge error, I think, on our part. So we've also underappreciated and I think overlooked the indigenous peoples, the victims of this settler colonialism, particularly in Crimea. But we could say the same in the Caucasus, in places like Circassia, for instance. Um, but we've particularly overlooked the Krimcha, Karayim, and of course, especially the Crimean Tatar. So they'll be our focus today. These peoples have become ethnic minorities looked at as historical minorities, peoples on the historical margins. That's for a Ukrainianist who's very attentive to how Ukrainians have been placed in that same marginal position in so-called Slavic studies or Soviet studies or even European studies, this kind of marginalization should be greeted by us with great suspicion and a lot of critical caution. And so that's where I've come from in my approach to studying Crimean Tatar culture and history. So we've rarely ever discussed this word settler colonialism with respect to Crimea, it's been what many would call in philosophy, the structuring absence, the elephant in the room for a long time. And our blindness to it has had really horrible con consequences for us all. I think it's impeded our ability to make historical parallels from other cases of settler colonialism around the globe. We could have used some of these historical parallels in policy after 1991 in Crimea. Um, we didn't do that. Um, and that was a major mistake. And we're dealing with the consequences of that mistake now. And for a Ukrainianist reading through Hrushevsky's materials, Drahamanov's materials, you discover that in the field of Ukrainian studies, there was a time when Krimsko Tataroznavstvo, Crimean Tatar studies, was a healthy subfield. Um, it wasn't booming, it wasn't exploding, but it was very strong. And that was, of course, thanks to polymath scholars and poets like Ahat Anhel Krimsky, whose Studios Krimu, as you see here, was a seminal work that offered wonderfully fresh insights at the time into Crimean Tatar history and literature. There are also journals like Schidni Svit, which still exists, of course, the world of the East, that also featured wonderful scholarship 
on, on Crimean Tatar culture. But with the advent of, of Stalinism, with the end of Koronizatsiya, the beginning of ethnic cleansing and genocide, Holodomor, the deportation, Surgun of 1944, everything changed. And, and we know this story all too well. The field of Krimsko Tataroznavstvo died, and it died despite a series of really important facts that we need to repeat to, to, to ourselves as much as possible. That is that Ukrainians and Crimean Tatars have been bound by many parallels and many entanglements. Crimean Tatars and Ukrainians were for centuries interconnected and at times overlapping stateless nations within the Russian Empire. They both lost their political autonomy at the end of the 18th century at the point of Kremlin rifles and bayonets. They were both na nations that endured not only ethnic cleansing, but also what I call discursive cleansing, which is not only censorship, it's the process of disciplining speech and thought. Um, the Crimean Tatars were discursively cleansed from Soviet life. Their towns, their villages, the names of them were erased from maps. Their very name, Krimske Tatare, was shifted after 1967 into something completely different that sought to separate them from their homeland. They're not mentioned after 1944 in the pages of print media. They become what George Orwell called unpersons. Ukrainians, Crimean Tatars alike, can understand these experiences. They experience them uh, over the course of the 20th century in a variety of ways. This is not the same experience. I don't want to combine and conflate these experiences, but there's a lot of learning between these groups that still um, is taking place now. To give you an example, in 1971, one of the Crimean Tatar writers we'll discuss today, Shamil Aliadin, he was asked privately why he had not used Surgun, the deportation of 1944, as subject matter for a short story or novel. He just shrugged his shoulders in response, and he said in exasperation, what for, and who would publish it? We are forbidden not only to write, but also to think about the past. Nam zaprašćeno ne toliko pisatno i dumat o peržetom. So despite all of these intersections and correspondences, many other things in addition, I think we've attended, we've, we've tended to uh, apply what's, uh, what's called the two solitudes paradigm to Ukrainian and Crimean Tatar cultures, wherein Ukrainian and Crimean Tatar cultures operate independently of one another. They engage in separate monologues or they talk past each other, or they use languages of stereotypes and misrepresentations that have been long cultivated by Russian historiography. And so in my view, this two solitudes paradigm is the product of Russian propaganda, Russian disinformation, Russian soft power, which has a vested interest in making sure even today that Ukrainians and Crimean Tatars make little sense of each other or make little real sense of each other beyond stereotypes and antagonistic misconceptions. This is something we urgently need to change without romanticizing without idealizing the relationship at the same time. Okay, so how do we begin to make sense of this relationship? And from the perspective of Ukrainian studies, make sense of Crimean Tatar history and culture. One common starting point is the man you see here, Ismail Gasprinsky or Ismail Bey Gasparale, the Crimean Tatar educator, journalist, and civic leader based in Bakshasarai whose journal, Terjuman, or Perevojcik, the interpreter, played a really unique role in promoting Tatar ideals in both the Russian and Ottoman empires. As many of you know, the motto of this journal, Terjuman, was Dilde, Fikirde, Ishte Birlik, unity in language, thought, and action. And this motto really neatly summarizes Gasprinsky's mission, which was really nothing less than to consolidate the interests and resources of Turkic communities around the world, from the Tatar to the Uzbek to the Kyrgyz, and to ready them for the modern age. But with all respect to Gasprinsky, as you can see, he's holding a copy of his uh, 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 periodical Terjuman in his hands in this slide. I want to begin somewhere else today. So I'd like to begin 
with an author whose verse I've, I've discovered over recent years who fascinates me completely. And he, his name here is, uh, as you can see, Hassan Chergeye. He's an author who becomes associated with a different newspaper, a newspaper first published in 1906. It was a newspaper that took a more impatient stance to Russian imperialism. So Gasprinsky with Terjuman was patient. He was playing the long game, hoping that um, the, the Russian Empire over time, like the Ottoman Empire, would open itself to Muslim communities. Um, the uh, younger generation that succeeded Gasprinsky was more impatient. They didn't want to wait for Russian, the Russian Empire to open itself up in this way. And the newspaper was called Vatam Hadimi, or Servant of the Homeland. And it's first published in 1906. This is, we might call it, a newspaper of the young Tatars. And we can think of it as Terjuman's stepchild. That is, it was very vocal, very disruptive, very unequivocal in denunciating and denouncing autocracy. So one of the characteristic lines from the pages of this newspaper was, quote, Tsars and Sultans offer nothing of value other than the gilded crowns on their heads. Vatan Hademi was really marked by the revolutionary energies of 1905. Unfortunately, only a handful of his of its issues still exist today. But we might say that uh, Vatan Hademi burned very brightly, but burned fast, and it finished its operations in the summer of 1908. And this newspaper, Vatam Hademi, often published poetry by a learned young scholar and teacher from Simferopol, you say, see before you, uh, again, named Hassan Chirgeyev. And one of his most remarkable works, in my opinion, is a poem called Eshit Mefta Nesolior, or Listen to What the Dead Man Says. It was published in 1909. And this has a lot of commonalities, really, a lot of connections to a poem like Veliki Lyok by Shevchenko of 19, excuse me, 1845. In that Chirgeyev is surveying, he's, he's offering a review of the crimes and injustices of Russian colonialism through a literary genre, the genre of the grotesque. So you can recall in Veliki Lyok, the use of ravens, um, that, that genre of the grotesque is, is partially seen in Shevchenko's poem. It's abundant and very obvious in Chergeyev. Now, Chergeyev, uh, like Shevchenko actually in 1845, um, was not quick to put his name on these handwritten texts. And in this particular case, Chergeyev did not write his name um, uh, on this particular poem. Instead, he went by the, the term Belgesis or anonymous. And he worked with a private publisher to release the poem. It was um, a 12-page pamphlet, the kind of width that you could place in your coat pocket. So it was very slim, very narrow. It caused a sensation because within months of its publication, particularly of the Russian translation, the Tsarist secret police identified Chergeyev as the author, placed him under surveillance, and in their files they noted very coldly and with some mockery, in fact, that he was, quote, unmarried 30-year-old who lives with his father, unquote. He was arrested and imprisoned in 1913. So the dead man at the center of this poem is a character, a Crimean Tatar, from the era of the Khanate. So recall that the Crimean Tatar Khanate existed from the 14th century until the end of the 18th century when Catherine II dismantles the Khanate uh, keep in mind that um, the Khanate was dismantled after four different invasions of the Crimean Peninsula by Russian military power. Sometimes 1783 is presented as this peaceful annexation in Russian historiography, in Soviet historiography. It was nothing peaceful. Um, we again saw a lot of brutality in the invasion of the Khanate. So the Khanate succumbs to this pressure. And the character at the center of Chergeyev's poem is someone who rises from the dead and wanders across Crimea, the Crimea of 1909, only to see that his homeland, in effect, doesn't exist anymore. So here, uh, Chergeyev adopts this literary genre of the grotesque and, and turns it upside down. Let me give you an example. 
So typically in the genre of the grotesque, we see reality that is being estranged by ghosts, monsters, uncanny others. But in Chergeyev's Eshit Mefta Nesolior, we instead have a living corpse who's estranged by reality. He's estranged by the reality of the Russian colonization of Crimea. This character is named Umer Oja, or Umer the teacher, and he's horrified by what he encounters across Crimea. As you can see here, the translation, villages were decimated, homes raised and destroyed, cemeteries destroyed, and from our tombstones, they built country estates. I felt I fell into the enemy's trap. I stayed thinking I was to blame. They drove me out crying, get out, Tatar scum. And I exclaimed, do you know what country this is? Because if this is the Crimea I once knew, it has fallen apart. I think you can sense some Shevchenkian notes in the poem. It feels familiar in a sense. And in this frightening land of the living, Umer Hoja discovers no traces anymore of Tatar culture. He sees only displaced, um, dislocated elite princes who no longer recognize themselves as Tatar and instead seek to pretend that they are uh, Russian imperial subjects. The Crimean Tatar that Umer Oja encounters have lost a sense of themselves. They've abandoned their identity. They no longer wear the distinctive uh, dress. Um, and they seek to, quote, look like Ivan. That's the term that Sergeyev uses. So uh, Umer Oja is disturbed by this Crimea of 1909. And what he does then is bury himself back in the grave. So the ending is rather pessimistic. Um, it offers the reader little optimism about the future of Crimean Tatar society in 1909. But at the same time, when one thinks about the literary genre here, we see that Sergeyev still implies that not all is lost. After all, if the dead can come to life, or as Shevchenko would have it, if the crypt can be recovered and opened, then the past has a future. The French philosopher Jacques Derrida once noted, quote, what characterizes a ghost, a specter, is that no one can be sure if by returning it testifies to a living past or a living future. So throughout his verse, Sergeyev suggests, uh, suggests that Crimea's living future is dependent on us as readers, uh, on the scales falling off of our eyes, on us facing reality and striving to do something to change it. Now, change was the goal of many contemporaries of Chergeev, one of whom you see here, Hussein Shamil Toktargazi. Every word that Toktargazi wrote was an attempt to answer one single question. And the question was, who are the Crimean Tatars? Toktar Ghazi was born near Baksha Sarai. He, in fact, lost his father as a child. So he could not afford formal education. He worked to provide for his family. Uh, so when one thinks of Mikhailo Boychuk, uh, Volodymyr Vinichenko, and other characters in Ukrainian culture who similarly came from a poor upbringing and had to fight for uh, their families, uh, Toktar Ghazi was a similar type of figure. He became a uh, self-taught artist who tried slowly to write poems and songs. But he was never considered as good as Hassan Chergeyev, the figure we just discussed. His poetic skills were simply not as sophisticated. And scholars like Bekir Chobanzadeh would later claim that uh, his verse had many shortcomings, as a cyclic was the term used. But that's to underestimate Toktar Gaza because he may not have had so much finesse, but he had a lot of force, both political and poetical. 
And uh, Krimsky would in fact say in 1930 that it was Toktar Gazi that injected the Crimean Tatar national idea with really unprecedented creative energy. He did, he did this uh, by exposing not so often the crimes of Russian imperialism. That's really the kind of focus that we see in Chergeyev's uh, Eshit Mefta Nesolior. Um, then it is, his focus was more in promoting more of a, a deep, almost religious connection between Crimean territory on the one hand and Crimean Tatar culture on the other. And like Chergeyev, Toktar Ghazi had a taste for satire. So he reserved his, his uh, sharpest rhetorical spear, not for local Russian colonizers, but for conservative elements of Crimean Tatar society that sought to use the imperial system for their own benefit. So in this way, both Chergeyev and Toktar Ghazi um, present a Crimean Tatar society at the turn of the 20th century that's mixed, it's heterogeneous, it's contested. Um, no one's singing from the same hymn sheet. They all have competing interests and even different aspirations and dreams. In 1909, the same year as Chergeyev's poem, Toktar Ghazi uh, wrote a play called Molalar Projekte, or the Mullahs Project. And this was based on his own experiences as an activist, he campaigned for the poor. And in campaigning for the poor, he worked to fight the influence of traditionalist clerics, the mullahs in Crimea. So this play imagines a meeting of mullahs who debate how to respond to figures like Toktar Ghazi, like these progressive Crimean Tatar leaders. And the mullahs in Toktar Ghazi's play show that they have no respect for the common Crimean Tatar man and woman. They simply refer to the common Crimean Tatar family as ignorant Tatars, Khara Tatarlar. And they also react to this idea that they should redistribute lands that they, the mullahs have to the poor with questions like, what are we going to live on? Should we serve these people for free? Now you can sense here some commonalities with the great work of Mikhailo Kotubinsky and even Toktar Gazi and Kotubinsky look, <laughs> look alike in some ways. And those of you who remember very closely all the works of Kotubinsky will sense a connection to one work in particular. And that work is the novella Pidmen Ratame, which was written by Kotubinsky during a, a summer journey to Bakshasarai in 1904. It was published in the journal Kivskaya Starina in 1905. This is a really fascinating work, a study of different conflicts between sectors and camps in Crimean Tatar society, between, in particular, uh, progressive, youthful enlighteners like Toktar Ghazi and these traditionalist conservative clerics, these mullahs. Those of you who've read it will remember that there is a really sustained focus on the lived experience of Crimean Tatars in the novella. That is, Pidmenaretame has no room for Ukrainians per se. The novella makes no explicit mention of anything Ukrainian. Yet I'd argue that Kotsubinsky uses this text and the Crimean Tatar case to comment on the Ukrainian culture of his day, particularly on the debate between Narodnitstvo and modernism, so populism and modernism. That was very much in tension in Fondosia Ukrainian literature. That is, Kotubinsky alludes to the fact that modernists like him, like Olya Kobylanska, like Lesi Ukrainka, have a lot in common with Crimean Tatars like Chergeyev, Toktar Gaze, and indeed Gasprinsky, Gasparale himself. These commonalities that figures like Kotsubinsky are beginning to explore are also discussed in publications in Istanbul about Ukraine. Um, so this is a pamphlet entitled uh, Ukraina, Russia i Turkiye from 1915. Um, you can notice the, the marking, very generous markings, in fact, of Ukraine's borders because they include Kuban, for instance, um, in this map. Uh, the writing across um, the territory there just 
reads Ukraina in Arabic script. Turkish writers at the same time in the declining Ottoman Empire were fascinated with Ukrainian culture uh, and Ukrainian writers and figures. You can see here uh, a focus on the Ukrainian national movement in culture, beginning with Kotlarevsky, continuing with Hula Kartamovsky, even Mikhailo Maksimovich you see here, um, who very importantly compiled um, Ukrainian folk songs that were very, very popular. Um, and of course, ending with figures like Kostomarov and Shevchenko. So a great deal of fascination across the Black Sea with Ukraine as Ukraine, not as some part of some other country, but as Ukraine itself. Of course, two years later, in the pivotal year of 1917, these commonalities were explored with political implications. When Ukrainian and Crimean Tatar activists actually worked to support each other, in what became a uneven and often dangerous climb toward national autonomy. In July 1917, roughly a month after Hrushevsky's Central Narada declared autonomy for Ukraine, a Crimean Tatar delegation visited Kyiv, hoping to follow in their footsteps. And among the people in this delegation was on the right here, Jafar Sedemet, his reflections on his meetings in Kyiv are fascinating. He talks about um, meeting Hrushevsky, for instance, and remembers how Hrushevsky is playful-eyed. He has a twinkle in his eye. Uh, he remembers that Petlura was the most sincerest, uh, the most sincere, the most enthusiastic about supporting the Crimean Tatar uh, political project. And when they met with Volodymyr Vinnychenko, they found someone completely different, someone who was off in his own world, was the way that Sedamet put it. And for those of you who've read, of course, a lot of Vinochenko, you can understand why. So Sedamet and his colleagues were very interested in understanding how indeed the Ukrainian national movement was progressing and how Ukrainian counterparts could support their aspirations for the establishment of Crimea's autonomy. But it was even more than that because apparently, as you can see with some difficulty in this slide, the simferopol based uh, newspaper, Golos Tatar, um, there's a reference here to this delegation of Sedamet, also Noman Chelebi Jihan, uh, as expressing a desire for the territorial annexation, the presoidenenia of Crimea to Ukraine. We all know, of course, that this story does not end well, either for Ukrainian political autonomy or Crimean Tatar political uh, autonomy. Nonetheless, however, the 20th century sees so much engagement and interaction. And I just want to highlight a couple of examples um, so that we have time for questions. In the 20th century, Ukrainian and Crimean Tatar collaboration and encounter takes to the silver screen. And in this case, um, I'd like to raise the instance of Alim, which is a film produced by Vufku in the 1920s, based on a play written by this man, Umer Ipci, in 1924. So Ipci was responsible for almost single-handedly reviving Crimean Tatar drama in the early Soviet period. He helped develop the Crimean Tatar state drama theater, it was called Tat Theater, and he developed it into a cultural force. A lot of his plays bear the mark of Tokhtar Gaz's influence. That is, they confront problems of social justice, uh, problems of social equality, um, problems like the plight of the poor, rights of women. Um, so Ibchi's work was groundbreaking. And Alim was one of his most popular plays. It was a work um, that reached into the past, into the realm of folklore. And visited the legend of Alim Aydamak, who is the Alexa Dov, Dovbush of, of Crimean Tatar culture, the uh, Robin Hood of 19th century Crimean Tatar society. And you can see here how Vufku really promoted this film. It billed Alim as a story torn from the pages of the Crimean Tatar, quote, struggle for their own national renaissance. Mikola Bajan, 
who, of course, the outstanding poet, but also the editor of the journal Kino, teamed up with Ipchi to write the screenplay. So another important example of this connection between Ukrainian and Crimean Tatar cultural actors that leads to a major intervention um, in the relationships between these peoples. The first time Ukrainian director Ryori Tasin took the helm of the project, while Crimean Tatar scholars and cultural activists like Usain Bodaninsky, who is director of the Museum of Turco-Tatar Culture in Bakhchisarai, um, you can see him on the left. Um, I think that's on the left, if I remember that correctly. No, that's Akshu Karakli. So on the right is Usain Bodaninsky. And he joined the film um, as someone who was supposed to ensure its authenticity. That is someone who could, from a scholarly perspective, make sure um, that the film was true to the life and the culture of the Crimean Tatars. Alim was an overnight success. It was released in 1926. It played to audiences in France, Germany, across the Soviet Union. Um, and in celebrating its achievements, Ukrainian critics, particularly in the journal Kino, highlighted one thing above all else. And the thing they were most proud of was that Crimean Tatars saw this film as their first national film, Svoya Persha Nacionalna Kartina. So we have a case here of Ipchi's play producing a success of Ukrainian cinema and a Ukrainian film that produced greater perception and understanding of Crimean Tatar culture. We're running short of time and I want to get to some more recent examples. So I'm going to pass over um, uh, Alim here and uh, instead focus on the figure I alluded to at the start of our session, and that is Shamil Aliadin, who is celebrated as Crimean Tatar's brightest star. Um, Crimean Tatar's uh, the culture and the literature's brightest star, and Parlak Yildiz is the term used. He's the Crimean Tatar writer most connected, I would say, to Ukrainian literature. And his story, his biography, helps explain why. Because in 1932, shortly after the publication of his first book of poetry, he was called up in, to service in the Red Army, and he was stationed in Starokonstantiniv in West Central Ukraine. So not far from the site of the decisive Battle of Pilyavsi, in which Khmelnytsky supported by the Crimean Tatars, scores a really critical victory, victory against Poland. And while in Staro Konstantiniv, um, he went on to command a cavalry regiment. Aliadin composed what is today, unfortunately, still very little known, uh, a very little known poem called E Buyuk Ukraina, O Great Ukraine. And I've translated an excerpt here. E Buyuk Ukraina. Keshmesin anilsa swasin lakinde yuragin khederli. Panarga kuluk chun eskinje tu binde yagan ve kulogan chop muzik evleri. O great Ukraine, if you mention your past, you are silent, yet your heart still grieves. In slavery to the Pane, here are the references to Polish landowners, and under the yoke, many peasant homes burned and reduced to ash. So Aliadin's Ebuyuk Ukraina is a very sensitive survey of the suffering of Ukrainian peasants at the hands of landowners. It certainly speaks to the typical Soviet ideology of the day, but nonetheless manifests this empathy and this connection, this understanding of Ukrainian culture and Ukrainian history. Um, as you can see, Aliadin never discarded his interest in Ukrainian literature. He, in fact, translated Shevchenko Zapovit into Crimean Tatar. The poem was Vasiet, as you can see here, um, published in 1939. He won a prize for it. And in fact, Tichina read Vasiet in Crimean Tatar at a meeting of the Union of Writers. I want to just touch upon a work that uh, Aliadin finished after Ukraine's independence, or I should say started after Ukraine's independence, but did not finish. It is a fascinating novel um, around the figure of Tugai Bey. So the Crimean Tatar Khan's uh, Nogai military commander who fights alongside Khmelnytsky 
um, and wins the territory of the what will become the hetmanate uh, for the Ukrainian Cossacks. Uh, you may recall this particular canvas by the Polish Romantic painter Jan Mateko, which is entitled uh, Bogdan Khmelnytsky with Tugaybe. Um, in Mateko's vision, both Khmelnytsky and Tugaybe are united in frightened astonishment at the dramatic appearance in the sky of the Franciscan saint John of Dukla, who materializes, who emerges to aid the Poles in 1648. In the novel, we are transported once again into this Crimean Tatar society of the 17th century that is very diverse, very rich. And I'll just highlight one particular moment in the novel that I found particularly fascinating. It's a moment in which Khmelnytsky appeals to the Crimean Tatar Khan, and a moment in which the narrator reveals that Khmelnytsky speaks Crimean Tatar, and so does the Khan speak Ukrainian. So this is Khmelnytsky's appeal to the Khan. Is it li ve sadat li islam gerei khan? Ukraina halki pulonya esaret le altinda in le mekte. Adamlar pek izildi, ach chiplak kaldilar. De di tatere tilinde, sonra Ukraina je uh, Ukraina jaga kechti. Khan getmani terjime siz dindidi. The Khan listened to the Hetman without translation. The implication here that the, the Khan also understood the Ukrainian language. Okay, uh, I think I have one more minute um, and there's a lot we can discuss, but I, I do want to keep to our, our, our time and not torture Roman with uh, my, uh, my delays. So to finish, I want to mention someone that uh, I ref referenced in this interview with Ukrainska Pravda, and that is a poet who's affected by the deportation of 1944, Yunus Kaya, who was a teacher in Simferopol, deported, um, and remembers the Surgun in uh, horrific ways in his memoirs, in which he talks about um, the difficulties of hunger, of death on the trains, and the sadness that was most unbearable. Now, keep in mind that at this, at this time in the 20th century, if Crimean Tatars were to publish anything in their language, they could not refer to um, the Surgun. In the same way, with the exception of someone like Vasil Barka, Ukrainian writers could not reference Holodomor. And so how did they process this grief? How did they process their trauma? Um, at times, they did so through the figure of Taras Shevchenko. And this is an example of a poem called Taras Shevchenko Ha to Shevchenko that was published in uh, the Tashkent Crimean Tatar language newspaper, uh, the banner of Lenin. And here, instead of talking about the deportation, he describes Shevchenko's exile in a strange land. Um, only really the title invites us to read these lines as bound to a particular moment in the 19th century. When you read this without the title, it feels like Timir Kaya is reflecting on the horrors of the deportation itself. And there are signals that you can see in this particular um, excerpt, and this is where I'm going to uh, conclude. Um, you'll see in this excerpt a reference to the Karakun, so the Black Day. And this is the way that the, the deportation is often referred to in Crimean Tatar culture. Shunya Sultave Tipolar Kuvdisani. Uzaktaki yat yabanji uker ulker lerge. Yash pashendan bas bahits is lik urdisani. Meshachli karakunde kirdin yerge. So on that painful black day, you were exiled. The reference is to Shevchenko on the surface, but deeper is a reference to the Crimean Tatar deportee. So in, as you can see here, the connection between the Crimean Tatar and Ukrainian peoples through culture is very intense. It's very intimate. And here you can see how Shevchenko not only allowed Crimean Tatars to process their experience, but how Shevchenko himself helped the Crimean Tatars survive this displacement. So with that, I'm going to conclude. Thanks so much for your attention. Uh, thank you so much, Rory, for such an extensive and uh, 
let us say, detailed and deep introduction to the topic. Honestly, I was surprised uh, to hear the story about the Crimean Tatar writer you mentioned, who asked to publish about the deportation, and he just shakes shoulders and said, why for? And uh, who will publish it, this story? And that is so important, I guess, especially uh, in, in our time for, for modern Ukraine, because sometimes we have uh, even similar voices. Why do we need it? Why do we need to learn Crimea Tatar language, Crimea Tatar culture, even sometimes if it goes to the governmental decisions? Um, I, I uh, was raised in Crimea and I was told in my school that uh, there are no really valid scholars within the Crimea Tatar community and even in the history of Crimea Tatars. And there, like in their culture was presented like secondary in comparison to Russian or even the Slavic uh, uh, cultures. And this is again, typical Russian propaganda they use even in our time saying that this is not war, but just this inner Slavic conflict with the small minority uh, of Crimea Tatars that are really not influencing on, you know, without any influence. So again, that's the part of propaganda. So thank you for your presentation and your emphasis on the numerous, really significant and valuable figures, writers and scholars. And this is actually the huge uh, heritage for Ukraine and for Crimea Tatars and the, the strong basement. And before we start to go, you know, to speak about the modern issues, um, mm -hmm. there are numerous questions from our participants and uh, dedicated to the deportation of Crimea Tatars. So if you don't mind, I will start with the, let us say, historical question. And um, so I will read it. Why was the Crimea Tatar nation chosen to be deported from the peninsula by Stalin as there were other ways to oppress and dominate over them? And also, which Crimea Tatar text depict the process of deportation the best? Or perhaps you can say, say you can mention Ukrainian authors and we can, let us say, um, uh, recommend them for our auditory. Thank you so much for those questions. Thanks to the audience for listening so attentively and Romana for your uh, for your questions. Um, I think it's important to reflect upon the deportation of 1944 because, of course, it's been subject to so much disinformation, hasn't it? And, and we, we, we understand now in this horrific moment we find ourselves in how these narratives about the Crimean Tatars took hold. So, first of all, it's important to recall that the reason, according to Soviet officialdom, that the Crimean Tatars were deported was because they were all collaborators with Nazi Germany. Of course, this is false, completely false. It's absurdly false because most Crimean Tatars fought in the Red Army. Thousands won medals from the Soviet Union. Six or seven, I think, were actual heroes of the Soviet Union. Uh, Ahmed Khan Sultan, for instance, is a very famous case. So why then deport the entire nation, accuse them of treason in this way, why be so brutal, particularly with women, children, and the elderly, because so many of the men were fighting at the front still. I mean, this is still 1944. Nazi occupation has just finished. So why? This is a question that has occupied historians for a very long time. The consensus now is that Stalin, in his paranoid imagination, was worried about a potential war with Turkey over control of the Black Sea. Um, from where we sit now, this doesn't seem so strange anymore. When we see how the Black Sea has been weaponized by the Kremlin, when we see how much focus is to the security of the Black Sea, we can understand that Stalin, as paranoid as he was, was interested in controlling the Bosporus and Dardanelles and was imagining that there would be a war in the future and that the Crimean Tatars and other groups who were Turkic um, might be threats to um, uh, Soviet power in that potential war. And that tends to be, I think, now the view most historians take, that effectively the deportation was uh, a paranoid act of, of concern about a future war. But the other thing we need to remember is the Crimean Tatars consistently reveal the emptiness of the Russian imperial project. I say emptiness because the Russian Empire expands. Uh, today, the Russian Federation is poorly understood in the West because it should be understood as an expansionist land empire now, not only in the past, but now. And the ways it works 
we're seeing horrifically now in places like Mariupol, Melitopol, Berdyansk, um, they project that Russian power has been there for all eternity, that the past of Russian connections, of the fact that uh, Pushkin was in Kherson, that that gives them a claim to this territory. But obviously the Crimean Tatars always reminded them that that was not true, that they had no rightful claim to Crimea. So in the background, you have this attempt to ethnically cleanse Crimea. And it started in the 19th century with, with Tsar Alexander II. So Tsar Alexander II explicitly orders the achishchenya of the Crimean Tatar people from Crimea, and he explicitly orders the settlement of Slavic peoples to Crimea. So this is an attempt on the part of both the Russian and Soviet empires to erase the Crimean Tatars because they show that the imperial message about uh, Russian imperial historiography in Ukraine and in Crimea is false, that it shows an alternate history, that the Crimea has a more diverse background. And so that's also part of Stalin's calculus. Think you're ah, and against... the second part of the question, sorry, the second part of the question is why study Crimean Tatar? Um, it's in many respects to respond to precisely this ideology. Because when we study Crimean Tatar culture or Karaim culture, or it, it doesn't matter what national minority or group within the, 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 the context of Ukraine, when we do this, we understand Ukrainian culture and Ukrainian history better. But it also is a strategic response to this uh, rhetoric of chauvinism um, that we hear from the Kremlin now. Um, Ukrainians are being told on a regular basis that they have no right to exist, that their state doesn't exist, that it's some sort of illusion and fabrication by Lenin. Obviously, all of this is absurd. The same things have been said about the Crimean Tatars. The same things have been said about the Crimean Tatars for a very long time. So when we actually look at the Crimean Tatar experience, we learn more about the Ukrainian one, and we can see that even though these two peoples were nearly eliminated, they were subject to genocide, they still find re a relationship that is, that is growing today. And it pains me to see um, questions about the Crimean Tatars now among my Ukrainian colleagues and friends, um, because it feels to me that Russian disinformation and that Russian framing is creeping back in and we need to stop it. And one of the ways to do that is through, of course, the pursuit of knowledge and, and, and scholarship. Yeah, thank you, Rory. We will uh, return to the questions uh, dedicated to the topic and opinions abroad, but still I have another question uh, in our uh, chat. And, um, you know, I remember when I was again young in Crimea and uh, we had from media, for the, you perhaps know the stories when the Crimea Tatars returned to you, to Crimea, they were looking for the apartments and their apartments was like, it was impossible for them to join their old apartments. So that is why they started to build small buildings in, in uh, free lands. And they, they started to say that, let us say, uh, that's lands dedicated to them. And in our media, I remember when I was again young, uh, the, the media told that, look, they have no rights for the for the, for this land, and uh, again, that was a, an attempt to to present the Crimea Tatar in a dark light. So, and here we have the question uh, from the our audience: Was was there any reflection in media of the processes of the return of the Crimea Tatars to their homeland in 1999, 1991, and uh, where we can read about this? Ah. Um. Interestingly, there is a lot of reflection in the works of the KGB, we might say, in the files of the KGB, um, beginning from 1967, about this issue of Crimean Tatars returning to Crimea. So to refresh your memory about this, in 1967, um, the Soviet regime decides to recognize um, that the um, Crimean Tatars have been exiled that they were accused of treason on a mass scale, but this accusation was, was wrong. So they rehabilitate the Crimean Tatars. However, they describe the Crimean Tatars, or the Kuramli, and we've talked about the, the diversity of the usage of these terms, but in 1967, the Kremlin decides to call them no longer Crimean Tatars. They're called the Tatars formerly resident in Crimea. So they begin to detach the ties that these Crimean Tatars have to Crimea. Um, and that's obviously a very dangerous uh, rhetorical move 
to position a group this way. So in 1967, we see the Crimean Tatars rehabilitated. Many interpret this rehabilitation as if they're being permitted to return. And so we have cases of Crimean Tatars going on trains, going to Crimea and standing outside their ancestral homes, walking along these homes on these streets. And we have cases of residents, that is settlers who were brought after 1944 to Crimea, expressing to security services a lot of anxiety. Gulnara Bekirova's excellent scholarship refers to a lot of these moments. Again, we hear a lot of these things in uh, Samvidav literature too. So there are a lot of poems written from the perspective of a Crimean Tatar who after 1967 does go to Crimea and experiences this um, encounter with a, a Russian colonizer who's taken um, her grandfather's home and is destroying the graves in the back garden of their home. Uh, a lot of very emotive poetry, even from 1967 onward. So after 1989, when the Soviet regime recognizes that the deportation was barbaric, that's the term they use, barbaric, the Crimean Tatars return. At this point, we have the same problem once again, that the local settlers are anxious and worried about the fact that every time they see a Crimean Tatar, they're reminded that they're living in a stolen home, in property that was not theirs to begin with. Um, and so this is a, a, a very sad and tragic refrain. We see it now in horrific ways. So again, in studying this history and also listening to the voices of the Crimean Tatars in this, in this instance is very important for us because we've seen how so many people have not listened to the voices and still don't listen to the voices of Ukrainians now. And we understand the importance of listening. And that's something we need to do with Crimean Tatars too. If, we, if we've learned that one thing, we need to, I think, bestow that honor and that respect onto them as well. And in this, in this case, Rory, I have another question. Uh, we know that Ukrainian studies are not presented extensively, let us say, in the Western countries or even around the world. And um, normally... Uh, they are like presented as the part of the Slavic studies or and where the Russian studies, let us say, like is playing the, the main role, is the leading role. And Ukrainian studies is almost, well, usually presented really uh, briefly. In this case, I have like two really small questions to you. Why have you chosen the Ukrainian studies as your main research and, and your, let us say, main research area from the one hand and from the other is the Ukrainian like uh, Ukrainian students, or is it again Ukrainian studies is popular among the Cambridge students? Uh, I'm I, I'm just I've just turned on the chat and I just see that uh, a wonderful British student uh, named Matt is actually watching this as well, uh, and I think he he would give you a very I think clear answer. Well, first of all, uh, I lived in Ukraine in the 1990s. I was a uh, a teacher in a village school for about two and a half years. Uh, Ukraine changed my life. It was a difficult time um, between 1995 and 1998. Um, but uh, I came home to the United States where I grew up, very troubled by the fact that I didn't know much about Ukraine before I lived there in 1995. And so I was very interested in learning more and to pursue a deeper study of Ukraine and Ukrainian culture. Um, in the States. And that's what I eventually did. Um, I would say since 2008, I've had a great privilege to work at Cambridge because the students here, most of them British, we don't have many with uh, a Slavic background at all. They are very, very reasonable. They, they look at the map of Europe. And for many years, they've seen that the largest country within the continent was very poorly understood. Um, and so they have, I think, delve deeply into the study of Ukraine. Obviously, since 2014, it became more urgent. Since 2022, even, even more, more so. In, in, in tragic ways, I've observed this interest. Um, and I, I wish it were not the case that this Russian aggression has brought on interest from British students. Um, but I would say it's a remarkable thing to see British students learn the Ukrainian language. We used to send our students to um, all the various universities that I think so many in the audience um, are affiliated with, 
they would go for their year abroad, their their vacations. They would study the Ukrainian language um, uh, in in places like Mohilyanka in Kiev, Uku, of course, in Lviv, Karazin in in Kharkiv. Um, so it's been a, a, an encouraging thing to work with these young British students. I think it's easy for us to become cynical and uh, pessimistic, <clears throat> and I have the pleasure of working with. Ukrainian and British students who keep inspiring me every day. So I think it's a good story. It's something we need to keep building constructively and to do it together. And that's why I'm so pleased that we're um, um, really working together in this in this forum as well. <clears throat> and this topic is actually uh, extremely important also within the country, within Ukraine. And uh, from that point and from that perspective, I have also the question for you. Of course, you are aware of, of the debates that all, that we have in our country dedicated to Crimea Tatars again and Ukrainians and, 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 and the language issues. But still, um, how should, from your perspective, again, how should Ukraine realize the importance of the Crimea Tatars and, and their, again, right to self-determination and and I, I'm not sure that we need in Ukraine the new understanding of Crimea, the role of this uh, region and the role of the people, the role of the religion. Again, even Islam is like 10 centuries present in, in, in the Ukraine. So uh, I guess that we we need to have this uh, re-understanding re each other. And what's, what is your perspective on this question from the one hand and from the other, what steps you, you can recommend uh, for us to do right now? Well, I think uh, the steps are steps like this one, not for us to learn from each other about uh, reorientating ourselves to the study of Ukraine. Um, and by that, I don't mean to abandon the ways we've normally studied Ukraine. Um, I think Ukraine is uh, remarkably diverse and fascinating. Too often, I think, in Western scholarship, it's looked at as a crossroads, or sometimes it's presented as a borderland. I understand this perspective, but I am more of the view that this is a bordered land, that um, Ukraine has a center. And when we look at different points of reference to this center, one of them is Crimea, of course. It's a complicated one, particularly when we look at the history of Crimea after 1991, the secession movements in the early 1990s, all of these things are the outcome of the deportation and the attempt to ethnically cleanse the Crimean Tatars from Crimea. Everything that we saw that was contested in Crimea in the 1990s could be traced back to uh, 1944 and the middle of the 19th century. Um, and I think there was a tendency, once again, not to listen. So when I say that, I don't reference only the Crimean Tatars. I also mean Ukrainians in Crimea too. So Romana, you would know this better than, than I, but there was a fairly vocal, small minority, but still a vocal Ukrainian language community in Crimea um, that published a newspaper, often published anthologies of poetry in Ukrainian about Crimea. And uh, some of these volumes were published in thousands of copies. They were distributed across Ukraine. I'm not sure how widely read they were because in conversations I would have in Kyiv, let's say after the Orange Revolution, um, there was this assumption that somehow there wasn't a Ukrainian speaking community that was culturally active in Crimea. And of course it was. And I visited with them, Danilo Kononenko and others um, at this particular time. So, so listening and being aware of, of the complexity of the local um, communities in Crimea to not always defer to that Russian presentation that you very eloquently explained earlier, Romana. Um, so forums like this are very important. Taking a Black Sea orientation, in addition to other orientations we have to Ukrainian studies, and then to try our best to learn Crimean Tatar um, and other languages of Ukraine, because this is a, a great gift that Ukraine um, offers us. Uh, I think often a people like Krimsky or Marko Vovchok or others who came from a different ethnic background, um, Moisei Fishbein, for instance, who comes from a Jewish background and is very um, articulate as a Ukrainian language writer and poet. There are so many figures who make the choice um, to adopt that Ukrainian civic identity. And that has been 
what's powered the Ukrainian national movement for centuries. And learning some of those languages is a great step. And to engage our friends and our colleagues about these old Russian narratives, these old Russian narratives about Crimea, about Crimea as the Eskona Ruskaya Zemlya, but then also the same stories about these stereotypes and these narratives about the Crimean Tatars. The moment we sent a strong division between Ukrainian and Crimean Tatar cultures in today's society, I would say there's the presence of Russian disinformation and Russian soft power propaganda. We need to fight that. This is one way to do it. Thank you again, Rory. And also, uh, thank you for your sentence. Uh, I use it like a quote. Black Sea uh, should gather in a united people, but not divide them. And, and it's really important at the geopolitical sense. And I'm really happy that finally Ukrainian government, you know, realized that the importance of the, of the global south and we have the initiatives provided uh, by different departments, you know, in order to show that that this region might be like a key, like a bridge to the to the countries of Islamic world or Middle East. And uh, again, it might be really important for, for Crimea, not from the only from the Crimea Tatars perspective, but in general, uh, when we're dealing with the country at, uh, in our country. Okay, now I can see that we have a question, Guyana Yuxel, you can we will unmute you and you can ask your question to Professor Finin. Yeah. yeah. Uh, unfortunately, uh, good evening, do you hear me? Yes. Uh, unfortunately, I uh, cannot open my camera. I don't know why. Uh, my name is Gayana Yuxil. I am a member of the uh, representative and executive body of the Crimean Tatars, indigenous Crimean Tatars. Uh, and at the same time, I am PhD in mass media and I work for Tauria National University. You know that this university was replaced and evacuated from Crimea after the occupation of Crimea in 2014. I'd like to uh, say thank you, great thank you, uh, Mr. Rohr, for your lecture, for your um, advocacy, for your activity, researches, and interest to my homeland, to Crimea, to indigenous Crimean Tatars. It's a very uh, big support for us. Uh, of course, we need international support, all of us. I mean, Ukraine and uh, Crimea as integ integral part of, uh, the Ukraine, of Ukraine. Uh, my question uh, will be about uh, will be about uh, future of Crimea uh, after the deoccupation. Uh, what is your opinion uh, on the possibility of creating Crimean Tatar uh, autonomy as a part, uh, integral part of Ukraine after the deoccupation of Crimea? Thank you very much. And Rory, if you don't mind, I will also add the small question to this, to Guyana's uh, question. How you can describe the relation of Ukraine's government and Crimea Tatars in 90s and what lessons for the future we can highlight based uh, on these cases? I guess that we can, mm. you know, combine these questions. Thank you. Well, first, Guyana, thank you for your patience. I noticed that your hand was raised and uh, thank you for, for uh, waiting so so kindly. Um, it's wonderful to hear about your, your PhD project and, and I, I really love to, to learn more about it. Um, I have been very privileged to work with one of the sponsors of this session, uh, Krimska Platforma, and I've been so inspired by the work they're doing uh, because I believe we need to begin rallying the international community, not around the terms Crimea is Ukraine, that's important, but to talk about the future of a deoccupied Crimea. And this is going to be a very, very difficult task that will occupy us, I think, for the rest of our lives. Because as you know better than I do, since 2014, uh, Crimea, and like so much of Russian society, has been awash in horrific disinformation um, and, and effectively brainwashing about uh, Kyiv in particular, about the West. And there are no easy recipes, there are no easy solutions to this problem. I think it's going to take a lot of time. The biggest thing I think is something that President Zelensky has, has emphasized that when Crimea is deoccupied, 
And when the Ukrainian state can offer a better economic and political future for all the residents of Crimea with a focus on justice, then I think we will see um, peace and unity come to the peninsula. But those two things have to happen. There has to be that economic progress, but there also has to have to be justice. So um, the, the plan that's been put forward about deoccupying Crimea, that is those who have settled from Russia, tens of thousands from 2014 need to leave. Um, there might be a process by which if they have a case, they can apply to return, but these things need to happen. And this is where we can learn from a lot of other cases um, of, again, settler colonialism around the globe. We put in place truth and reconciliation commissions. We invest in public education. The international community cannot lose sight of what is needed here. And that's what I worry about the most is maintaining this attention uh, from international diplomats, international political leaders about Ukraine, of course, above all, and then as well specifically Crimea and what's needed. Um, Ramans raises an important question about the 1990s. And here you can see, first of all, a success story because Kyiv invested millions of dollars in the resettlement of the Crimean Tatars. Moscow invested nothing. The state that was guilty, the successor of the guilty state that deported them in an event that was called barbaric in 1989 by the Politburo itself, invested not a dime, not a penny in the resettlement of the Crimean Tatars, which was very uneven, as you know, better than I do. Um, Samal Zakhvati, Hutt's inability for Crimean Tatars to receive licenses, to have businesses, the in incident on Ai Petri, if you recall that, after 2004. There were too many occasions in which the government in Kyiv took the Crimean Tatars for granted. They knew that the Crimean Tatars would have a pro, and I don't like these terms, pro and anti, but I'm going to use one here. They had a pro Kyiv position. And unfortunately, um, many presidential administrations took that uh, for granted in their negotiations with local elites um, in Crimea in the 1990s. We even saw after 2004, 2004 that Yushchenko's presidency sometimes took this support for granted too and didn't, didn't defend the rights of the Crimean Tatars in the way that they should have. So uh, Kyiv has to look at the massive error here that had the, the millions of dollars that were invested in resettling Crimean Tatars also be invested in empowering them and empowering civil society, fighting these narratives, and above all, using the term empire and colony. And that's the huge problem that I think um, is something that we've only now, since February 2022, taken very seriously. That is, Crimea and Ukraine have been subject to Russian imperialism, and therefore, there needs to be a decolonization process that is mature and sophisticated, that learns from other cases of decolonization around the globe, applies those measures in policy, uh, electoral quotas, reparations, I mentioned truth and reconciliation commissions. These things should have been done in the 1990s. The West did not speak of them. Eve did not either. And I think we need to first recognize this history and overcome it through these various policies. And so the, the example of the 1990s is a very important one. I think it's a story of success in some respects, but also a lot of failure um, because there wasn't this recognition of the need to empower the Crimean Tatars and the Ukrainians uh, and to reach out to those Russian elites on the peninsula and to showcase um, the crime of the settlement of Crimea after 1944, but at the same time, offer them a recourse to overcome that crime. So there's a lot to do. Thankfully, we have really serious people in uh, Krimska Platforma in, in the Ukrainian government now. And I think there is very steady focus on the part of Western politicians and Western analysts um, that will finally, I think, um, overcome these mistakes that we've made too often in the past. Thank you, Rory. And in this case, uh, perhaps as the last question, the small uh, addition, uh, I usually refer to the, to the term, I guess you invented, it calls Krimnesia. And uh, yeah. I guess I'm, I'm uh, continuing the, the previous question. So uh, 
from the one hand here even in ukraine uh, well sometimes we need to remember that there is the war and then the crimea is is really important uh, a significant part of this war and you mentioned in in the interview that the war starts from crimea and should finish there and about the Kremnesia and about the, the Western support, how do you think, I mean, from your perspective, from global perspective, from perspective of UK, um, what is the, the, the main tendencies that uh, are now presented in the Western countries from the one hand and from the other, what is your perspective, especially on the phone of the, the, the different uh, conflicts right now that we have uh, in the different parts of the world? So for us, for Ukrainians, I mean, it's it's. It, crucial it's extremely important uh, to realize uh, about this support whether how do you feel whether this support is becoming stronger or a bit less stronger and uh, again with your help we realize that Kremnizia will not work but still uh, what is your opinion from your perspective thanks again Romana for the question um, and I'd like to thank all those who are asking questions in the chat too we, we can't get to them but I've, I've been looking at them as well um, I, I would say two things, really. The, the first is this Kremnesia uh, is, uh, has been a huge problem. Uh, it, it caused me to despair from 2014. Um, and that refers to this sense among Western scholars and, and diplomats and politicians that uh, what happened in 2014 um, was a blip on the radar that it wasn't such a big deal, um, that it wouldn't lead to more aggression and escalation, when, of course, every single competent scholar in Ukraine in particular, and then around Europe, understood that the danger was always that the Russian uh, forces would tear into the Kherson Oblast to secure the water supply to Crimea, because Crimea is very arid, very warm, and it's not for nothing that on the first day of the full-scale invasion, that's exactly what these forces did. They they sought to control um, the mouth of the North Crimean Canal. Um, in my experience, military officials were aware of these things. Diplomats became too focused on the psychology of people in the Kremlin and made mistakes that Orwell would talk about in the Second World War. That is, we assume that our sense of... Uh, international relations and international connection would also be the same sense that Russians would have without really listening to Russians themselves who have been pumping the domestic information space. I'm sure uh, Guyana and her work in mass media knows much more about this. Um, they've been pumping terrible disinformation about uh, the West and about the the um, the in inclination of the West towards Russia um, for a very long time. So unfortunately, these mistakes were made by Western analysts. Among them was the sense that somehow Crimea was was Russian. And, and this is something that mystifies me. Um, I think it has a lot to do with the Crimean War. The fact that the Crimean War in the 19th century was a war in which um, many British, French, European readers um, saw the action unfold in real time in newspapers. It was the first war, it was called the first armchair war, the first war that people consumed through the news on a daily basis in real time. And I think this mingled Russia with Crimea in the popular uh, imagination. And that coupled with Russian disinformation about Crimea and their attempts to efface and erase the Crimean Tatar past, the Greek past, the multi-ethnic past, um, all of that, I think, conspired into a perfect storm. And we're slowly but surely, I think, dismantling this narrative. Um, it's taking a lot of time, but I think it's getting through. So in that sense, I'm I'm, I'm quite optimistic that people have, have begun to understand just how complicated Crimea is. And more importantly, how important it is that it's within the bounds of the Ukrainian state. The very fact that on February 24th, Russian forces catapulted into Kherson Oblast was recognition of the fact that the peninsula of Crimea has to be connected to mainland Ukraine. Um, the Isthmus of Perekop is not a place for a border. It never has been for centuries. That's the reason why the Crimean Tatar Khanate was never just a peninsula. It was always the steppe land of southern Ukraine, too. So slowly but surely, we're making this message clear to politicians and analysts, but it's taken a lot of time. 
The other thing is, of course, this fear about Putin's red lines. Um, obviously, those of us in the Ukrainian information space think these concerns are absurd. Um, with each red line, once the Ukrainian military, the Zesa U, uh, overcomes and, and steps over that line, there isn't a nuclear holocaust. There isn't a nuclear Ar Armageddon. And I think slowly but surely, um, various political officials are seeing that Crimea is not some sort of sensitive place, that this is indeed Ukrainian sovereign territory and should be fought for. The, the question becomes how it's fought for. And that's where I think the discussion about urban warfare, um, uh, questions about degrading military assets on the peninsula, this is the kind of conversation that is taking place now. And it's a good thing it's happening. It should have been happening years ago. It should have been happening in 2014. Um, but nonetheless, um, better late than never. And so these two aspects um, are different, but they're being addressed in uh, the same kind of energy and the same manner of focus by those of us in academic life, as well as in political and military life. Thank you, Professor Finian. Again, uh, so many insights and significant, significant emphasis on our culture, on our history, and again, honestly, new materials, new material and new information. So uh, thank you again for this extensive and massive um, presentation. And uh, also, I want to say, uh, maybe I will tell this in Ukrainian. Я також хочу подякувати вам, друзі, що ви знайшли сьогодні час. Я впевнений, що ви не просто провели цих півтори години разом, чи, скажімо так, послухали як слухачі, але ви, я впевнений, ми всі разом зінвестували в цей час і пришвидшили, і ця інвестиція в те, аби пришвидшити перемогу, бо зараз нам так потрібно в цей складний час, коли ми всі наелектризовані, коли так багато різного роду пропаганди і так багато різного роду підкидають нам стереотипи, ксенофобії і так далі, всі ці кейси, про які згадував професор Фінін, говорячи про історію, так показують нам, що ми насправді, знову ж таки, маємо великий ресурс для того, аби протистояти міцно всій цій пропаганді і міцно українці всі разом різні, різних етносів і національностей е, думали про спільне майбутнє. І саме, саме це відчуття, я переконаний, якраз і допомагає пришвидшити таку омріяну для нас всіх перемогу. Тому дякую вам, що ви сьогодні були з нами. Дякую також партнерам, організаторам. And thank you, Rory, again for this extensive presentation. I will think about this again more and more in order to, you know, to take all information. So thank you again. Дякую, дякую вам, your... пане Романе. Дякую вам. І я дуже, і ще раз, дуже вдячний за запрошення. Дякую всім за увагу. Uh, все буде Україна. Крим сербест олоджах. Слава Україні. Героям слава!